Amen. There was a sitcom in the early 80s and 90s about a group of people that got together every single day at a Boston bar owned by a guy named Sam Malone. Now, you may have watched this sitcom. And the bar's name was Cheers, and so they named the show after the bar's name, Cheers, because at Cheers, everybody knows your name. And I think the theme song of Cheers really captures the big idea of this show. And so I'm going to try to sing it for us. And maybe you can sing along as well. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see. Our troubles are all the same. Come on. You want to be where everybody knows your name. I think the theme song really captures the heart of what Cheers is all about. And when Cheers ended around 1993, there was another sitcom that emerged. And this sitcom was about six friends who would get together quite frequently, not at a bar, but at a coffee house. And these six people, they would go through every, every experience that life could throw their way. Now, I'm not going to sing it, I'm going to save you the pain, but I'm going to ask Pastor Nate and Cassandra to sing the song for us. So no one told you life was going to be this way, child's a joke and broke, Love life's the your way It's like you're always stuck in second gear When it hasn't been your day, your week, your month, or even your year But I'll be there for you When the rain starts to pour I'll be there for you Like I've been there before I'll be there for you Cause you're there You're always stuck in second gear When it hasn't been your day, your week, your month, or even your year But I'll be there for you When the rain stops to pour I'll be there for you Like I've been there before I'll be there for you Cause you're there for me too great. I'll be there for you because you'll be there for me too. And I think deep down inside, that's how God created us when it comes to relationships, that we want to be known, that we want to be heard, that we want somebody to know our name, that we want to be there for somebody, and we want somebody to be there for us. That's God's heart for all of us. Now, there's a powerful theme in the Bible, in the New Testament particularly, that communicates this idea of how we were created for relationship. And it's the word koinonia. Why don't you say it with me wherever you are? Koinonia. There you go. You learned a Greek word today. And that word simply means fellowship. And the idea of koinonia is that I want to do life with you on the deepest level because I know that I need you and I know that you need me. See, that is God's design for relationships, that we know each other on a deep level because we need each other. See, but that koinonia, it doesn't happen by accident. It takes intentionality. It takes work. We don't drift into relationships that are life-giving that last. And so since relationships are so important, and that's what this series is all about, you, me, us, it's about relationships. How can we develop life-giving relationships that last? How can we build into the people around us? 
Now today, we get to learn from no one better than Jesus, because the right answer is always Jesus. But when we see the story of, when we read the story of Jesus in the New Testament, in the Gospels, and the Gospels are simply Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in your Bible, and they tell the story of Jesus. When we read the story of Jesus, Jesus was exceptional in developing life-giving relationships that last. He was great at it. And there's no one better to learn from than Jesus. And so today, we're going to look at an interaction that Jesus had with a blind man in Mark chapter 10. And this blind man's name was Bartimaeus. Now, for simplicity, I know that is, uh, you know, boy name of the year for 2021. But for simplicity's sake, let's call him Bart. Now, Bart was this blind guy that was begging on the side of the road. And he encounters Jesus, and Jesus heals him. But that's not all that happens. Let's read the story. So if you have your Bibles or a device, let's turn to Mark chapter 10, and we'll pick up the story in verse 46. Here's what it says. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bart, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him. They told him to be quiet, to knock it off. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 49, Jesus stopped and said, call him. I want you to circle, highlight, underline that verse right there. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet. He came to Jesus. Verse 51, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Verse 52, it says, go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. See, when we read a story like this, especially the story of blind Bartimaeus, we think that it's all about the healing. We think that the main, the main or the central message of this, peri- of this story was about Jesus healing Bartimaeus. But I want to show us today that there's something so profound about what Jesus does for Bartimaeus. And it teaches us how to cultivate and develop those life-giving relationships. For point number one, if you're taking notes today, Jesus does something that challenges us. He helps others feel fully seen. He helps others feel fully seen. I love how Mark 10, 49, that verse I told you to highlight and underline puts it. Jesus stopped and said, call him. In the midst of Jesus' busy schedule, he's got places to go, he's got things to do, he's got appointments on his Google calendar, he's got sermons to write and sermons to preach, he's got kingdom work to do. Jesus stops and he calls blind Bartimaeus. See, what I love about Jesus is that Jesus is great at seeing people and helping them feel fully seen. In fact, Jesus does this all throughout the gospel stories. Jesus saw women. He saw kids, especially in a time where women and kids were not elevated. They had little to no status in the first century. Jesus saw them. He saw the wealthy person. He saw poor people. He saw leaders who felt misunderstood. He saw social outcasts. He saw people who had the wrong type of jobs. In fact, he invited one of those persons to follow him and become one of his disciples. Jesus saw people who were marginalized because of their ethnicity. And Jesus not only saw them, Jesus elevated them. And that's what I love about the the gospel message, the message of Jesus. It elevates people. In fact, when we read the story of Jesus, the phrase he saw or Jesus saw, it occurs time and time and time and time again repeatedly in the narrative of Jesus. And Jesus was great at helping people feel fully seen. Now, here's the thing, though. It's oftentimes easy for us to look past people, to ignore people, because we're busy or we're preoccupied or we're we're distracted. It's easy for us to not fully see people. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and they're looking at you, but they're not really looking at you? It's like they're looking past you. See, we do that all the time. We miss the people that God has brought into our lives 
but not Jesus. I was thinking about this question this week. Why is it that we mostly see people when they do something wrong? Why is it? The barista that is slow, or your checkout person that is having a hard day, or the sound guy at church when he messes up. You know, why do we notice people when they do stuff wrong? Or when they're doing something that maybe inconveniences us? Why do we do that? And then we do like what the people did to Bart. They rebuked him. They told him to keep quiet. They ignored him. That is our tendency. But Jesus is challenging us. If we want to build into other people, we need to fully see people. Now, over the years, I've learned a lot about seeing people fully from my wife, Kelsey. It's a work in progress for me, but she does a phenomenal job at seeing people. And I remember several years ago, we were going on a, it was date night for us, and we were going to get uh, Mexican food. Uh, I should clarify, we were going to get chips and salsa. And we usually pick our date night place, the restaurant that we go to, based on the quality of their chips and salsa that they serve. That's just how we do things. Hey, no judgment here. And ideally, in my world, as the hostess is bringing us to our table, the chips and the salsa would arrive simultaneously. That's like, that's a perfect world for me. The chips and salsa will arrive as we are sitting down. That's like, who cares about the menu? Who cares about the drinks? We did not come here for the menu and the drinks. We came for the chips and the salsa. And don't give us those little dinky salsa cups. Like, give us a salsa bowl and not just one. Like, give us one each because we share everything else but not our salsa. And so I remember this date night. We're sitting there. We're just having a good time and there was no service and the service was slow. And then I see our server and it looks like she's having a hard time. She's getting, she's flustered, she's overwhelmed. You know, it looks like things just weren't going right that evening. And I was getting irritated. I was getting irritated. Like, how do I, do I ask for the manager? Like, what's going on here? I was getting really irritated. And finally, she comes over to serve us and she's frantic and she's apologizing profusely. And I'll never forget it. Kelsey reaches over, grabs her hand and says, honey, take a deep breath. It's okay. We are so glad that you are our server today. I'll never forget it. And now she's crying and tears are streaming down her face. And she says, thank you so much. You don't know how much that means to me. I've had the hardest of days. And that is the nicest thing that anyone has ever said to me. Gang, what would it look like if we did that more often? What would it look like if we saw people? Isn't that what we all want? to be known, to feel seen, and to feel heard. See, that's what we want. And what would it look like for us to do that for the people around us? So how do we do this well? Let me give us three tools to help us fully see people well. One is this. It begins with awareness. Awareness. The posture of awareness says, I want to know how you're feeling, not just what you're saying. And because that's the posture of awareness, uh, a person who is aware, they begin or they enter into a conversation with a heart of curiosity. I love this meme that I've run into over the past several weeks, several times. And the quote is this, the meme is this, be kind because people are fighting battles you know nothing about. Aren't you fighting a battle that people don't know about? See, Awareness enters into your world with the heart of curiosity because we want to know how you feel more than what you're saying. Awareness. Uh, The second tool is this, acceptance. There's this great verse in Romans 15, verse 7, where the Apostle Paul says this, accept one another then, just as Christ has accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. See, acceptance, when we accept people, we leave judgment out the door. To accept people is to embrace them without a spirit of judgment. And this posture begins with a listening heart. Here's another tool, the third tool, validation. Validation is about me not dismissing what you're going through, even though it may feel insignificant to me. Because while it may be a small deal to me, it could be a big deal for you. And validation leads with empathy and sympathy. 
That's powerful. I heard this story um, of one of our teenagers many, many years ago who came into youth group one evening and she was just having a hard time. She was just, she was crying and she was just, it was like the world had ended for her. And everyone was wondering what's going on. Did she get hurt? Did someone in her family die? Like what's happening over here? Come to find out that she was distraught because she had ordered a prom dress and her prom dress wasn't coming, wasn't going to arrive in time for prom. And I know you could be thinking like me, oh my gosh, really? That's it? What about world hunger? What about world peace? What about sickness? Like there are bigger problems in this world. But here's the thing. Her leaders rallied alongside her and they encouraged her and they helped her out and they cried with her. They didn't slap a verse on her and tell her that this is what the Bible says. They sat with her in her sadness and her ashes. That, my friends, is validation. Is when what appears big to you, even though it's small to me, I'm going to approach you with empathy and sympathy. What if we did that? Here's a challenge for us. What if we begin every day with this prayer? God, as I go about today, help me to see people the way you see people. What if that was our prayer? What if our prayer was, would you help me be more aware of people? Would you give me the ability to accept people without judgment? Would you give me the courage to validate them, even though I may not understand what they're going through? What if you prayed that prayer every single day? Watch and see how God uses you and watch how you will begin to see God's children all around you. Uh, one of the other ways that we build up those around us, point number two for today, if you're taking notes, is this. Commit to constantly encourage others. Commit to constantly encourage others. Now, Jesus was phenomenal at encouraging people. Uh, one time, he encouraged Peter. And he encouraged Peter when Peter was getting it wrong and Peter was saying the wrong thing and Peter had his foot in his mouth and Peter was just a failure at that time in Peter's life. And Jesus says something and he calls him the rock. In Matthew 16, verse 18, he says this, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. He says, Peter, there is coming a day where I'm going to build my church. And we know that day happened in the book of Acts, but Jesus encouraged him way before it happened. And he said, I'm going to build my church on you. You're going to be the rock. Now, before there was ever a Chris Rock or a Rocky Balboa or a Dwayne the Rock Johnson, there was Peter the Rock. He was the original rock. But I wonder if Peter, in the book of Acts, as he stood up that day and he addressed the people and he preached the gospel with clarity and we know that they were touched in their hearts. The Bible says they were cut in their hearts and they gave their life to Jesus. I wonder as Peter was about to speak, I wonder if he remembered the encouragement of Jesus. I, rem I wonder if he remembered those words where Jesus said, Peter, this is what I told you was about to happen. You are the rock. See, that's the power of encouragement. Another time, Jesus would encourage a Roman centurion, where Romans, especially centurions, they were at odds with Jewish people. And he would say, hey, everybody, look around. Look, look, look at here. Look here. Look at this guy. And Jesus would say in Matthew 8, number, uh, verse 10, I tell you the truth. I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. Jesus encourages him. Now, here's the thing about encouragement. We all can do this. We all can do this. This is hardwired into us. The word encourage literally means to give courage to somebody else. In other words, hey, you need courage? Let me give you some courage. You're having a hard time? Let me give you some courage. That's what encourage means. And we all can do this. We can do this because Jesus says something so profound about us. He says, guys, you are the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. Now I was thinking about salt. Salt was an important commodity in the first century because there was no refrigeration and they needed salt to preserve their food. But not only that, salt is what adds flavor or enhances flavor to foods. Salt is critical. Now, if you're watching and you're going, I ain't putting salt on nothing. Well, I don't think I can trust you. But salt really enhances flavors. Uh, I, I noticed this on cooking shows. They're constantly saying, 
Hey guys, salt generously. Salt generously. Maybe you've heard it on a cooking show. And when I think of salt, I think of encouragement is like salting your food. Encouragement is like salting your food. Salt generously. And that's a metaphor for what we're to do when it comes to encouragement. Guys, salt generously that everybody you come eyeball to eyeball with, encourage them and salt them with encouragement generously. What would it look like for us to sprinkle some salt of affirmation? See, affirmation is when I look for the good in people. Affirmation is more than a, hey, great job, great job. Hey, good job. See, we all can do that. Let me give you some tips when it comes to affirmation, especially you parents. The more specific you can get, the better. Don't just say great job. Say, you know, honey, I love how you express your emotions. I love how you're so inquisitive and how you ask some of the best questions. I love your creativity. I love your sense of adventure. I feel like we're always exploring new places because of you. See, that's affirmation where we call out the best in people. And don't just affirm their accomplishments, affirm their character. That's powerful and it'll change your relationships. Here's another way. What if we shaped some salt of hope? What if we shaped some salt of hope, you know, or Pepper some hope in there. See what I did there? What if we shake some salt of hope? Shaking some salt of hope is to speak life into people's future. It's to speak hope and life into people's future. Here at Newbreak, we like to say this all the time. Hey, the best is yet to come. And it's not a pithy saying. We really believe that God's best for you and our best days in spite of what's happened, they're ahead of us. They're before us. They're in the future and they're not in the past. And so we love to shake some salt of hope because hope speaks of the future. Now, what would it look like for us to shower some salt of celebration? You know, maybe Salt Bay style, you know, shower some salt of celebration. See, Jesus was a master of celebrating everything. Matter of fact, one time the Pharisees accused Jesus of being a glutton and just a party person because Jesus celebrated everything. What would it look like for you to celebrate your neighbor's new job? or celebrate your neighbor's kids promoting to high school, what would that cost you? Absolutely nothing. And yet it will make a world of a difference. I remember uh, some years ago, I was in my early 20s at a little small church up in the LA area. And it was my first time preaching. I'll never forget it. How can you forget it? And so I'd been studying all week and it was Sunday and I got up on stage and guys, I, I blanked and I almost passed out. And it wasn't one of those churches where you get like credit for passing out. You know, it's like, oh, the Holy Spirit was, no, no, it wasn't one of those churches. You get no extra credit for passing out. And when I finally composed myself, you know, I opened my notes and I read the chapter from, I, I read the, the chapter from the Bible, uh, from the wrong chapter in the Bible. Yeah, I mean, there is no coming back from that. Yeah, I read the wrong chapter from the wrong verse in the, in the Bible. Actually, to come to think of it, I might be preaching the wrong sermon to you right now. No, just kidding. We're, we're right on track. But I read the wrong chapter. And I remember feeling so down and so discouraged. And Oh, man, you know, what am I going to do? And I'm not cut out for this. And I'm never going to get another shot. And I told you, you shouldn't even try to preach. And I'll never forget it. My pastor at the end of the service, he came up to me and he said, I know you're probably feeling really crummy right now. But Isaac, I just want you to know that God has called you and God has gifted you to do this. In fact, you're on to preach next Sunday again. What was he doing? He was speaking encouragement and hope into my heart. When he could have said, oh my gosh, that was horrible, and you're never going to get up there and preach it again, you know, because people are going to leave the church. He could have said that, but he never said that. He encouraged me. And there are many days when I look back on that day, and I go, God, that was a defining moment in my life where he spoke encouragement and hope and future and destiny into me. And I'm so thankful that you placed encouragers like him in my life. And here's the thing, God has placed people around you that he's called you to encourage. And you're shaping destinies and futures and you are giving them hope. Now there's one last piece to this, to building re healthy relationships or life-giving relationships that last. And this is probably the hardest, but 
but it's so important. And we oftentimes get this wrong. If you're taking notes, point number three is practice sharing perspective. Practice sharing perspective. In the past year, we've experienced so much discord and disagreement and disunity and hate. And in all my life, I've never seen us more against one another another than how I've seen us in the past year. And probably in the process, we have burned some relational bridges because of this. Now, here's the thing. The Apostle Paul, he challenges us and tells us that there's a way to share our perspective. In fact, sharing our perspective is healthy. And it should be based and grounded on the truth of God's word. Let that be the filter of our perspective. And he says there's a good way and a healthy way to share perspective that honors God and honors other people in the process. Because here's the thing. We cannot be right with God and not be right with people. We cannot love God and not be okay and not be right with the people around us. And the Apostle Paul says there's a way to do it that honors God and honors others. In Ephesians 4 verse 15, he says this, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. And here's the key, he says, speaking the truth in love. Now, maybe you've been on the receiving end of some conversations where there's where there's no truth and no love. That's not good because that leads to gossip and slander and just a bunch of lies and rumors. Or maybe you've been on the receiving end of a conversation where there's all love, no truth. See, that's flattery. And we don't grow in environments where there is no truth. Maybe you've been on the receiving end of a conversation where there's all truth, but no love. That's just harsh. That's just mean. That's like borderline jerk status. No one wants to be on the receiving end of that. So that's why the Apostle Paul says it has to be all truth and all love. But there's a third ingredient to this, and that's grace. Grace is a reminder that people get grace because they need it, that I get grace because I need it, and therefore I need to offer them grace. Imagine what would happen in our relationships if we had those three ingredients, love, truth, and grace. And then later on in that chapter in verse 29 of Ephesians 4, the apostle Paul would unpack it a little bit more and he'll talk about the power of our words. And here's what he says. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Notice he says four things, and I I think these are four great filters or four great questions to ask when it comes to our words. In other words, before those words leave the tip of your tongue, before you hit enter, ask yourselves these questions, ask ourselves these questions. Is what I'm about to say, is it wholesome? Is it wholesome? Here's another question. Is what I'm about to say, is it helpful to build others up? Is it going to build somebody up? Third question, does it meet anyone's needs? Does it meet anyone's needs? Fourth great question to ask is this, will it benefit anyone who listens? And if the answer is no, the Apostle Paul would say, don't say it, even though it may be true. I love this verse in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 24. And I think it's a picture of what can happen when we begin to do this right. Uh, Solomon, who writes the Proverbs, he says this, kind words are like honey. Oh my goodness. How many of you like honey? I love honey. Honey on an acai bowl on a hot day. Ooh, that is so yummy. He says, kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. See, when our words are seasoned with grace and truth and love, they bring health to the body, the body of Christ. The body of Christ is united and lifted up under the banner and name of Jesus. 
Now, maybe you've been watching the Olympics recently uh, along with, well, pretty much the whole world. Um, and our family has been watching the Olympics. And my daughters are really into the gymnastics events. And so it wouldn't be uncommon. We'd be watching the gymnastics events and they'd be trying to mimic the movements. So they'd be trying to follow, you know, what's going on in the gymnastics world on screen. And the other day, my, my oldest daughter, Everly, who's turning five, who's five, um, she was doing some of the movements and she, she goes, dad, look at me, look at me. And maybe you remember that phase of parenting. Maybe you're in that phase of parenting. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. She was like, dad, look at me as she's doing these gymnastic movements. And without looking at, looking at her, I was like, oh, honey, that is so good. That's so awesome. You're so talented. I think you have a future and career in gymnastics. I say this without looking at her. And she turns around and she looks at me and she says, dad, how can you say that? You're not even looking in her five-year-old sass. See, when I think about our God, our God isn't that way. Our God pays attention to us. And maybe you're listening right now and you're going through some things in your life and you don't feel seen and maybe you don't feel heard. And you look at God and you're going, God, I don't think you see, I don't think you hear. See, one of the greatest miracles in the Bible is that we serve a God and we know a God who sees and hears us. In fact, there's this great prayer of blessing in the Old Testament. And it's a prayer of blessing that God teaches his people, Israel. And it's found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. And in that prayer of blessing, it talks about the face of God. Let me read it for us as a prayer. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I love that picture of the Lord turning his face to you. See, to turn your face towards someone is to give them your undivided and full attention. That's what that means. It's like God is saying, I have nothing else to do, nowhere I'd rather be. I'm fully devoted to being with you. And God right now, he turns his face towards you and he hears what you're going through and he sees the pain and he's not absent. He's right in the thick of it. He's sitting with you and he's encouraging you and he's giving you a hope and a future. And he's reminding you that he's a God who has turned his face towards you. And here's the great news. Because God has turned his face towards us, we get to turn our face to other people, to the world around us, to the people that God has brought and called you to. We get to model what God did for us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the reminder that you're a God who doesn't turn away your face. You're a God who turns your face towards us. And so God, remind us that even in our darkest valleys, you are there and you see and you know and you hear. So I speak courage and I speak promise and I speak hope over my friends that you would meet them where they need you to meet them in Jesus' name. And God, I also pray, God, that as we go about our week and our day and the months ahead, God, that we would be so in tune that our prayer would be, God, help me to see people the way that you see people. God, let that be our prayer so that we can make a difference in our world, so that we can cultivate these relationships that last. And we promise we will give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, as we transition into a time of communion, we get to celebrate what Jesus did for us on the cross. And when it comes to God's relationship with us, I love how John puts it in John 15. He says this, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And God demonstrated his love for us in this, that he sent his son to die in our place, in our stead, for our sin, so that we can be in right relationship with God. And so if you have some bread and maybe some juice, 
Would you go ahead and grab that right now and let's partake and let's join in communion together. Jesus, he would demonstrate the significance of communion and he would grab bread. And it says, the Bible says that he broke the bread and then he blessed the bread. See, that was a symbol of his body that was about to be broken on a cross for us. Symbolic of him carrying the weight and the sin and disappointment and the sadness of the world and death on himself. And he broke it, but he blessed it. And it's a reminder that even in our brokenness, even on our worst days, it is blessed by God, that God is able to bless it and redeem it and use it. So would you join me in partaking of the bread right now? God, thank you for your body that was broken for us, that you carried and you took upon yourself our punishment and our sin on you, Father, so that we don't have to carry it. Thank you. Help us to live in that reality more fully this week. And then he took the cup and he said, guys, you see this, this juice? This is symbolic of my blood, my blood that is going to be shed and it's a sign of a new covenant, a new agreement, a new arrangement for everybody, for the whole world, an agreement between God and them through my blood so that they can go to God. They have access to God. They can be in relationship with God. And the blood of Jesus, it gives us life. It gives us hope. It gives us vitality for today and forevermore. So would you join me in drinking the cup? Father, thank you for your blood that paid the price, that paved the way for a new agreement between God and us. That we can go directly to God because of you. So Father, help us live in that reality and help us experience the life-giving power of your blood that heals, that cleanses, that renews, that restores, and that redeems. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, would you join us as we end our time? Nate and Cassandra are going to lead us in a song. And would you just worship God and allow his truth to wash over you right now? Forgiveness was bought with 
the precious blood of Jesus Christ.